And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldees, and the bands of Syrians, and the bands of Moabites, and the bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had did. And he also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Now turn to Jeremiah 22. 17. Jeremiah adds to that description of him in this. Jeremiah 22, 17 says this. Speaking of Jehoiakim, but thine eyes and thy thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. That is the description of the king. Mm, Not so glowing terms. He overtaxed the land and had little regard for anyone's interests other than keeping his own power and position. Unfortunately, our country's leaders have become that. His leadership was characterized by deceit, bloodshed, Bloodshed of anyone who would oppose him. Corruption. Hmm. Sounds familiar. He squanders state funds and used forced labor to build a new palace for himself. Okay? This is the height of his, I don't know what you want to call it, but his own self-interest. While Babylon's in the process of destroying him. Egypt is trying to, he's given money, he's taxing the people and giving money out of, off the backs of these people, and he's giving it to Egypt, and then eventually he'll give it to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. While he's doing all that, he builds himself his own palace. The nation's crumbling. The enemies were knocking on the door. And he's building himself a palace. (laughs) A palace he would never live in. The message through the prophet again here was judgment. The Lord's intentions were to punish Judah by the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and deportation to Babylon for those who were fortunate enough to escape his wrath. The book of Habakkuk is unusual in that this prophecy never directly addresses the nation. As you look through it, he never once addresses the people of Judah. The only one God is talking to is Habakkuk. He's explaining what he's going to do to Judah, but he's talking directly to the prophet. It's not just judgment on Israel. It's also judgment on other nations as, you'll, as we'll read through it too. Habakkuk is a rec- record of a conversation between God and the prophet, a conversation where the prophet questions and God answers. Did you ever just want to call time out in life? Our halftime. Ever been there? It's like, wait a second. Okay, God, time out, please. Stop it. <laughs> Stop all of it. Let's talk. Let's have a face to face talk. Lord, I got questions. You got answers. Let, let's you and I have a little QA session. You ever been there? Maybe you're living there right now. I, I know I am. Right? You just want, hey, I got questions. You got answers. I want, I want to know. 
It addresses all kinds of questions, and you will likely agree that its message that it has is highly applicable to you, to me, to us as a church, and our present situation in our country. There's two main questions, but there's a whole lot of what I call baby questions <laughs> that come off of this two main questions. The two main questions are, why does wickedness prevail in this world? Why does it? And the second main question is, why does God use wicked people to chastise the righteous? Now, I'm sure you've all asked that question before. So let's look at both of them. Back to Habakkuk. Now we're going to run through it. I've got 20 minutes. We can do it. One, one, two, and four. I know we can't do it. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to give myself, encourage myself. Number one, two. Oh, Lord, here's the first question. How long shall I cry and thou will not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou will not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Why does wickedness prevail in the world? The wickedness that Habakkuk is describing is not necessarily, catch it, it is not necessarily the wickedness of the lost, but who? Those that claim to be his people. He is describing Jehoiakim <laughs> and his government and his people in Judah. He laments over the sin of those that are supposed to know better the people of Judah, God's people, he could, he could understand, okay? And I think we all can understand and deal with the treachery from the heathen and the unbelieving. But he just could not come to grips on how the so-called righteous could be even more wicked and deal more treacherously than them. And worse yet, this is the thing that breaks his heart. Worse yet, God seemingly ignores their actions. You ever thought that? You ever pray that? Why does God allow his people to continually sin? Why do you, Lord? Why do you tolerate it? Why must I continually have to endure and pray for the wickedness of others who claim to be born again? What? You ever think that? I mean, I pray and you pray over and over and over again for people that should be here that are not here. That you know, know the truth and don't seem to ever want to, they just go do their own thing. Not only are they doing their own thing, but they're, they're wicked. They're, just, they're no different than lost. In fact, they're worse than the loss because they know better and they still do the same things. Why do I have to endure and pray for people who live like the devil? I pray and I pray and there's just no change in them. He comes to the end and he's just like, God, justice is just paralyzed. You, you, you can't go to a judge because the judge is unrighteous. The lawyers are all slimy, the lawyers. The people are all corrupt. People just want to do what's right in their own eyes. Lord, it appears to me that you just don't care. You just don't care. You know, the state of some people in church, and frankly, in the state of worship in this country, makes us scratch our heads often. What in the world's going on out there? 
I've gotten to the point where I'm so numb of it. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to hear it. I know I have to hear it because I need to protect you as the shepherd of his sheep. But it's kind of, it's, it's like, I just don't want to hear it anymore. I'm, t it, I'm weary of it. it. It's just too much at times. That's where Habakkuk is. Lord, I, I just, I, I look at it and I, I can't take it anymore. In fact, I, I just don't want to pray anymore. Why don't you just stop it, God? Verse four gives us three result, or yeah, three results because of poor leadership. Just that this is a little side. I'm gonna throw you a little side here. There's three results because of poor leadership and corruptness of God's people. He gives here, and, and it's true all the time. Here are the three. The law was paralyzed. Law, justice, righteousness just doesn't exist. We can have all the books of law that we want. You know what? It does no good when those laws are in the hands of people that are corrupt. I, do you, we, we on the same page here? I mean, I, I listen to Fox News, and I'm it's, just turn it off. You can't take it anymore. You, you, an example is illegal immigration. Uh, they've been talking for 15 years about laws for immigration. It's like, you got laws. Just enforce them. You just don't enforce them. Arizona is the only state that enforces them. In Texas, it's, to some degree. It's like, just enforce them. You don't need more laws. You need to just do what's right. We spend all kinds of time and money coming up with more laws and more people put in positions of authority and more departments and blah, 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 and the list goes on and on. But there's laws paralyzed because the people are corrupt. They don't need more laws. Even if they had one law, they would corrupt that one law. So what we do is we add more for them to ignore and get frustrated over. Number two, justice never prevails. Okay, the one who's guilty never gets convicted. The one who is his right never ever is upheld. Never. Justice never prevails when you're like this. And number three, the wicked hem in the righteous. Okay, they close them in so that justice is perverted. When God's word and what is true and right are of no concern in a society then the result can be nothing but wrong choices. You understand? We see the symptoms, but the reason, the root cause, is that the ungodly and Christians have no regard for truth in our land. Pastor Burns gave a very good understanding of that this morning. What is right, therefore, their decisions... Their decisions are all screwed up. There's no fear of God. There's no fear of God who he is and what he says. Therefore, every decision that comes out of the minds of these people can only be screwed up. Ooh, thanks, Pastor. I'm, I'm happy that you gave us a good... <laughs> a good understanding of why wickedness prevails in the world. So God gives him his response. Are you ready for it? Here it is, verses 5 through 11. This is God's answer. Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are also are as swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to the eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. 
and they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. And notice that's lowercase. God's reply to Habakkuk and you and I is this. Oh, I'm doing something. I'm doing something. Right? I'm, not, I'm not sitting idle. You think I am, but I'm not sitting idle. You know, God is not sitting idle on what's going on in his, in what we would call churches or in his, in this nation or any other nation on the face of the earth. I'm doing something, all right. I'm preparing to chastise the nation by raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to destroy you. Wow. Thanks, God. <laughs> Thanks for that answer. That's a great answer. That comforted me. <laughs> so you're going to destroy us. Great. I will punish you, and I will punish your you with nations that you regard as evil and wicked your answer Lord brings me more questions than it does answers so God's solution okay God let me get this right your solution to the problem of injustice that I face day by day is to bring wicked people in to destroy us to exact even more injustice that's really the answer oh let, let's put it in our terms okay god so we're wicked we all agree the united states is wicked okay our leaders are corrupt our people are corrupt even those that claim the name of christ are corrupt so oh so you're gonna bring china in iran Russia, North Korea, to come into our land and destroy us. You, you'll bring the Muslims in and just come and just, just destroy us. Or the Buddhists. That's, that's the answer. It may be the answer someday. I, I don't know. I'm not allowed to time out. <laughs> Note the character of the, these instruments of God's wrath. Bitter, hasty, fearsome, dreadful, a law unto themselves. They had no concern for di uh, diplomacy. It, it amazes me sometimes, some of the people we deal with, is, well, let's sit down at the table and discuss it. They don't care. <laughs> you understand? They, they don't care at all. They just want to destroy you. Well, let's sit down and talk about it. There's no talk. I, I'm just going to destroy you. They had no concern for diplomacy. It had no concern for human life. The Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar were literally a war machine, as he mentions here in these verses. They're ever advancing, okay? They're unstoppable. This unstoppable war mystery machine that strikes with speed and swiftness as an eagle. It must have been how Europe felt when Hitler came in and blitzkrieg with the, the airplanes and the, uh, uh, the tanks. I mean, he takes Hungary in a day, Poland in a day, okay? It just sweeps through Europe. That's how Babylon was. You know, eagles, and Lord willing, we'll see some tomorrow over at Raystown. You know, eagles are the most fascinating of birds, aren't they? I mean, I just look at them and just marvel at the strength, the speed, the power of those, those birds of prey. My kids are over here laughing now because I, I think I see an eagle on every, every mountain. 
But you know what? Eagles are impressive to us, aren't they? They're great. But you know what? If you're the rabbit, if you're the groundhog, if you're that striper that comes to the top of the surface tomorrow, if you're the prey, they're not so nice, are they? Because they inflict instant death with those talents. There are all those other things, but above all, they're what? They're arrogant. They're good, and they know it. They're powerful, and they flaunt it. So summary to question and answer number one. <laughs> we must understand and remember something. That God is concerned less is less concerned about the injustice around us and done to us than he is concerned about the injustice done in us and by us. You catch that one? That's the main point. We think what we see is unjust, but he's saying, you know what, my servant? I'm more concerned about you. I'm more concerned about what you think and what you do and your relationship to me than I am about the lost, than I am about the so-called Christian. And we forget that. We tend to be more concerned about the injustice done around us and to us than we are what we are and what we do to God. Ultimately, he will take care of the injustice of the ungodly and the unbeliever. For now... He's concerned about you and me. Question number two. Got a few minutes. Let's at least introduce it. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine holy one? We shall not die. Lord, he won't kill us. He won't kill us. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. And another verse you probably are very familiar with. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than, thee, than he and makest man as the fish, fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them which, with a, the angle. They catch, catch them with their net, in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat is plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations. I will stand upon my watch, says Habakkuk, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. God, you're holy. How can you do this? How, how can you use the Babylonians to, Babylonians to destroy us? They're, adult, they're idolatrous. They're ruthless. They're more wicked than us, even on our worst day. You know, I have bad days. You have bad days. We all have bad days. But we're choir boys compared to these guys. 
Though Habakkuk did not know the fullness of the atrocities of the Babylonians, he did know enough. Okay? He knew enough about them. All right? To know that he was in great anguish <laughs> at God's response. So God's plan and solution to the problem of injustice of his people was to bring a wicked people in to exact even more injustice. The prophet and you and I are struck more on how God works. I don't know about you, when I read the book of Habakkuk, I am more struck on how God is working than his actual plan. I, I know nations rise and fall, but I'm, I am struck that, God, you would do it. You're holy. How can you stand around and allow us to be caught like poor, helpless fish in a net? To be devoured by these ungodly heathen. You know what you're going to do, God. And this is one of those questions that's not there, but it's in his, you can read it between lines. You know what they're going to do, God. They're going to attribute their victories to themselves, that they did it in their power and their might and not you, even though God is using them, right? They will attribute it to their power and their might, and they have no regard for human life, but you still choose to not only permit it, but to use it, use their wickedness. How can you allow them to experience this sense of twisted enjoyment and success in their cruel actions? How can you remain silent and do nothing? And if you're going to do that, how long are you going to be silent and do nothing for us? I think one of the things of 9-11 that was so distressing is that God would use someone like Al-Qaeda to destroy us. I mean, um, these people are wicked. Uh, you can say whatever you like. I'm not getting to a religious debate. They're evil. And if that's God, then, man, I don't know any person on the face of the earth should ever follow that religion. It's absolutely, it's, it's beyond our imaginations as, as Americans and as Christians in America that anyone could do what they do to people and have no regard at all for human life. That was the Babylonians. That was Nebuchadnezzar. Next time we'll look at God's reply. It's a little bit better than the first one, <laughs> but only marginally. So as we close this, a full understanding of God and his work in our lives and in this world may be painful at times. It's a painful learning process causing us great anguish but a full understanding of God will always produce proper responses. They will always produce a greater understanding of who God is, of his power, of his person, and ultimately will always lead the person of God who loves him back on their knees in praise and adoration to God. You know what? He is, he is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. God is absolutely holy. And he is not going to let this go on forever. And he is not unjust. We are unjust. He understands fully. We don't always understand so fully. That's why he's given us his word and his spirit to give us that full understanding. If you take the time over the next couple of weeks, because we won't get back to this to the 25th, as you read the end of it, you'll understand one thing, that God 
can make us joy and give us joy in him in the most difficult situations of life. And even in situations that we think are unjust because we do have a just God. We do have a righteous God, a sovereign God, even though in moments of time it doesn't seem that way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are holy. You are righteous. You are just. Lord, help us, your righteous ones, to live by faith and not by sight. Lord, to cling to you, to cling to the promises of God in our difficult, difficult situations of life. To look to you for the answers, even though the answers may not be palatable at times. Lord, help us to look to you for the answers. Lord, help us to pray for people and a nation that need to repent and turn back to you. Help us to be used of you, to have that compassion to reach them with that truth, despite their constant rejection of it. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name.